um, delighted to welcome Arnold here tonight. So just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, Dr. Arnold Horner formerly uh, taught geography at uh, University College Dublin, and he contributed two chapters on the development of Maynooth uh, in Terry Dooley's et al. aspects of Irish aristocratic life, essays on the Fitzgeralds and Carton House Dublin, uh, uh, Carton House Maynooth, Dublin, was published in Dublin in 2014. He also contributed uh, a history of Maynooth to the Irish Historic Towns Atlas series, which has been produced by the Royal Irish Academy. Academy. Um, Specialising in the geography of Ireland and in the history of mapping in Ireland, he has written three books. Mapping Offaly in the early 19th century, published in 2005. Mapping Meath in the early 19th century, 2006. And Mapping Sligo in the 19th century, 2011. Very easy just to say that, isn't it, you know? <laughs> so, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Professor Arnold Horner for what I am sure will be a very interesting and informative talk on Building Maynooth 1700 <coughs> to 1900, some key features in the making of the village and the creation of a small town. Thank you. Thanks very much, folks. Uh, it's a good idea to do the clapping at the start rather than at the end, I think. Um, and uh, what I'm hoping to do, if I can work the slides properly, is run through quite a lot of slides. Uh, so it will be going quite fast because there's a time limit on the whole procedure as well. So what I'm hoping to do is mainly focus on the period 1700 to 1900. And I just want to point out before uh, going too far that uh, some of the images that I have are copyright of various institutions. Um, I, I don't think that's of particular relevance to uh, enjoying them or uh, understanding them, but I do want to point that out and a permission to reproduce it at their discretion. Uh, part of what I'm doing is based on uh, what I did uh, a long time ago in the uh, last century. Uh, in, <coughs> uh, in 1995, uh, the Irish Historic Towns Atlas produced uh, a, 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 a what they call a fascicle, which nobody understands, but it's a it's a it's a, a booklet on Maynooth, um, and uh, it's a, also based on uh, material that I've gathered over various uh, quite a long time now. I think my first engagement uh, with Maynooth was in the late 1960s, in fact, so that puts it back quite a long time. Uh, now, uh, I suppose one theme that I'm going to come back to from ver at various times during this presentation is uh, a, a notion that I have that uh, while uh, the maps in the Historic Towns Atlas are quite interesting, um, I think, uh, and they reveal quite a lot, they also conceal quite a lot. So I have this phrase that I'm going to come back to from time to time, the map reveals, but it also conceals. And what the map reveals when you look at the Ordnance Survey map, the first edition of the Ordnance Survey map, uh, the six inches to one mile map that was produced uh, in the uh, late 1830s by the Ordnance Survey of Ireland as part of their series of 1900 sheets covering the whole of Ireland, uh, is this image of uh, Maynooth. And it shows uh, very clearly, I think, uh, the uh, regular layout of the town at that stage, the wide main street um, and various other features. Uh, you'll probably be able to pick up the old uh, RC uh, chapel and the new RC chapel. Um, and uh, just there down where it still is, uh, the church, the Church of Ireland, uh, it, it, at near the entrance to the college gates and this particular image is of the town rather than the town plus the college. So uh, as I've said uh, the particular feature that the Irish Historic Towns Atlas decided to concentrate on was the layout, the plan of Maynooth <laughs> and they were particularly I think keen to highlight that regularity that uh, seems to characterise a lot of uh, the 
town as it was then, and in particular the wide, straight main street. So if we just want to think a little bit about uh, the development of Maynooth, uh, I think we could probably uh, split it up into a series of major episodes. Uh, some of you will have been at the uh, lecture by Michael Potterton last week, um, and uh, he focused particularly on medieval Maynooth. Um, I think that you could think about Maynooth in terms of being a medieval stronghold of the Earls of Kildare, and probably associated with that uh, large castle, a, a small settlement. You could think about then an interval of destruction and stagnation, and then uh, the development of a small uh, estate-dominated uh, town or village. And then in the 19th century, a new college and its impact, and finally uh, its explosion as a commuter town. So we wanted to put dates on these uh, developments. I think we're talking about the 13th to the 16th century for Maynooth as a medieval stronghold. We're talking about the 17th century as being uh, an interval of destruction and later stagnation. Um, started off very brightly, as we'll see in a moment, but uh, then uh, subsided very quickly. Uh, the development of an estate-dominated village starting off in the late 18th century, and then in the 19th century, a new college and uh, its uh, quite considerable impact on the town and village. And then finally, in the later 20th century, <coughs> from the 1970s onwards, uh, the expansion of Maynooth as a commuter town. Um, part of uh, what I did to, to in preparing for this was just to look at the population figures and it's hard to imagine now that in the 1971 census Maynooth had a population, was recorded as having a population of 1,254. Um, that's excluding the college students, I think, but nevertheless, 1,254, and in the 2022 census, it's over 18,000. So it surged in the late, uh, the late 20th century. So here's the idea of the really strong, large Norman keep uh, that was the core of the settlement in the medieval period. Um, its uh, ruins are familiar to all of us uh, at the present time, uh, and uh, we can uh, see it emerging and expanding, particularly in the early uh, 1600s, um, when a major new development uh, was uh, erected alongside the medieval keep. The, the new buildings were part of a an early 1630s initiative by the great Earl of Cork, Richard Boyle, um, who was uncle of the Earl of Kildare, um, and he wanted to create, modernise the castle area, as it were, make it a state-of-the-art, uh, open Renaissance-style castle and courtyard. And the earliest plan, uh, which was made in the 1630s, shows the medieval keep uh, circled in red here, um, which was by then part of a, a much larger complex. And it's very handy that we have this, this plan, which was probably made either during or uh, at the end of the, uh, of the uh, new building's development. It's very handy that we have this plan. Um, and then the, the new buildings are shown here in yellow. Uh, circled around in, in yellow. And then uh, the other element of this is it's a big castle complex at that stage. Um, there's an outer enclosure um, which is labelled, uh, pointed to in green here, um, number F, and that's described in the key panel here as the green before the gate. The green before the gate. And what this uh, this area took in was the, the church. It went right over to the uh, church, the present Church of Ireland, um, and uh, it 
uh, it, it, it included uh, quite a substantial courtyard area. So uh, here are some of the elements uh, that were uh, shown in the reproduction of the plan uh, made for the Journal of the Kildare Archaeological Society in 1894. So the point that I'm trying to make here is, uh, for those of you who, who may not have sort of tweaked it already, uh, the the, the 17th century castle enclosure was much larger than the castle uh, area is at present. It extended across the road at the entrance to the college um, and, as I said already, reached the present-day Church of Ireland. So um, if you're uh, familiar with plans and you can register this one, um, the blue area is the railed-in area at present. The red area is roughly the area that was once part of the castle complex. And I'm making this point particularly because it would be very easy to think that that railed-in area is the castle and that from an archaeological or conservation or heritage point of view, uh, the wider area is not so significant. In fact, there is a very large area that has a medieval uh, conservation significance uh, in, in and around the castle area. And uh, I suppose I tried to do this uh, just to show you what it might look like when you uh, try to match up the, uh, the map uh, of 1630s with an air photo today and uh, those of you who are a bit sharper on the uh, on it or, ha or, or can pick it up quickly will probably notice there's the church uh, and there's the church on the the plan you see and we can start picking out bits of um, of outline i think that still still represent elements there's the stream that that comes down parson street and ends up joining the Lyrene River uh, somewhere uh, near the bridge here. Uh, and there's the stream on the, on the castle plan. And you can start picking up quite a lot of uh, elements of boundaries that relate back, can be related back to that 1630s plan and which deserves to be considered a little bit uh, when you're thinking about perhaps elements of heritage and so forth. So um, this is the this is the the element of the 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 the, the new buildings that is left from the uh, from the, the the great Earl of Kildare's uh, efforts uh, in the 1630s. Uh, it was a pretty elaborate complex. Uh, it was valued at being worth three thousand pounds in 1641, which was the highest valuation for any building in the Dublin area. But it was a development that had a very short life because in 1647, uh, during the turbulence that followed the Great Rebellion of 1641, uh, the, uh, the castle was extensively damaged and was made uninhabitable. So, uh, but, uh, and as a result of that, uh, a very dramatic looking ruin was um, created. And descriptions of the 16, uh, late 1600s and early 1700s portray a ruined castle complex. <coughs> so uh, this is the sort of imagery uh, that uh, this is from a, a later, uh, uh, later 18th century image, I think. But uh, uh, Thomas Monk, uh, writing in six, the 1680s, talks about... Uh, in a rather, you know, archaic language, where Maynooth, where is to be seen the remains of an ancient pile, that's the castle, venerable in its ruins, and which did partake of the hottest and felt the fiercest malice of a revengeful enemy in the last rebellion. Uh, so that's what the castle uh, was uh, like uh, in the late 16, uh, 1600s. It's an image of decay, it's an image of stagnation, and it's an image that persisted into the late 18th century. And yet, some sort of village or settlement seems to have coexisted 
with this scene of devastation. In a rent roll that was made in the 1680s, there's mention of a mill, a tan house, a new shop, a slaughterhouse, a cabin employed for a schoolhouse, and uh, there's records for 24 houses and at least six cabins. And by then, too, Charles II had granted uh, a, a right for a weekly market and two annual fairs. So there's action going on in and among or beside those ruins. John Dunton, who was a traveller, and as you can see from the bottom, wrote a, a merry ramble to the wild Irish, um, not exactly the most uh, flattering of descriptions to put on the title of your book. Um, John Dunton made a tour of Ireland in the, uh, I think around 1700, and he talked about Maynooth being a tolerable village with one or two good inns where meat is well dressed and good liquors, liquors be had. And uh, I think he made a few comments about the women as well, but th that's, that's been left out of this particular uh, talk. We had to shorten the talk at some stage, you know? Um, so, um, now, um, I want to move from this talk about the castle area to talking about the next episode uh, of Maynooth uh, in an era of change and improvement. By the mid-1700s, there are signs of change. And that's evident in the improvement-minded approach of the landlords who had come back to Maynooth having spent some time in South Kildare and out of Ireland and so forth. The Earls of Kildare, later the Dukes of Leinster, and during the uh, 1740s and 1750s, the then Earl set about uh, improving and creating the large new house uh, that has become Carton. Uh, this was a 25-year project that involved building a large house, acquiring land, and laying out a landscaped park. It's a long-term project. It's a lifetime's achievement uh, in many respects. And the present-day carton, enclosed by the wall, is shown on this uh, slide uh, in the red, enclosed by the red, the red line. Uh, the original carton was slightly different. Um, it, it was, uh, it, it was a, an area to, to the, uh, that, that had bits, bits of it inside the present carton, bits of it outside. Um, I think it's now called Old Carton, this area. And then um, what happened was part of the project was just buying in the land. And uh, why did they want this particular area? Why did they want all this land acquisition? Well, it gave them, meant that they could have a scenery, uh, a, se a scenic setting for their house, because it, it, you've then got both sides of the rye water. Uh, I think it's the rye water, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's the rye water. I'm getting mixed up on that one. Um, and uh, it, both sides of the rye, rye water uh, is included then, and it gives a, a, a nice, uh, a, attractive uh, landscape uh, to surround the uh, house. Now, the, the development of Maynooth uh, was really a spin-off of the Carton Project, um, like it, many other estate villages of the 18th century. But it was on a much more low budget, longer drawn out development. And it's only, uh, it, it, I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about just how that development unfolded. And the, the early part of it is shown on a map, which was um, uh, made of the Maynooth area in the 1750s uh, by one of the leading map makers of the time, a guy called John Roke. And he had a, an international reputation. He came to Ireland for six years. And part of his uh, act activities in his six years was uh, mapping the estates of the Earls of Kildare. And that kept him occupied because the Earls of Kildare had 68,000 acres 
so that it wasn't just a question of drawing a line around a farm. It was a line around a very extensive area of County Kildare, um, in different parts of it, a lot of it in South Kildare. Um, and then uh, he also, at the, alongside this, was making maps of the city of Dublin, the county of Dublin, the county of Armagh. Um, so he, 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 was, he was a busy guy. Uh, and, uh, uh, but part of his actions was to uh, survey and map Maynooth as part of his commission from the Earl of Kildare. And this is the kind of map that he produced. Uh, it's now in uh, Cambridge University Library, one version of it. There's several versions of it. Um, one of it's in is in Cambridge University Library. And I just put in for, it's going to be a bit hard to, to, to orient on this, but we, we'll, we'll take it in stages. Here's the avenue here, right? Everybody knows the avenue in Maynooth. And here's the church, uh, the, the church, the Protestant church, the Pro Church of Ireland now. So that's what we're talking about. And where you see bits of red or uh, vaguely red uh, it indicates uh, buildings, okay? So there's the avenue, and that seems to have been there at least by 1750. Probably a development of the 1740s, I think. Tree-lined, straight, connecting Carton with uh, the village of Maynooth. And one of the things that is very clear uh, uh, from uh, zooming in a little bit more is the irregular nature of the street plan at that time. Uh, you can see this is the road that I, I think comes from Straffan or maybe Selbridge uh, at that time. And there's the, a the sort of open space here. This might be a well here, I think. Um, and this is the castle here. And the main road went out uh, through, uh, through the castle. Um, you actually went through the castle gates uh, if you wanted to go to Galway or uh, Kinney Gad or anywhere like that, you know, uh, um, all those points west. Um, it, the Great Connaught Road, as it was subsequently described as, went through the castle until about 1800 or thereabouts when the present day bridge uh, that near the manor, old manor mills, that bridge was built uh, about 1800, 1804, thereabouts. So we can pick out various features. There's a charter school which was uh, to help bring up orphan children as good Protestants. Uh, there's uh, uh, the Catholic chapel uh, that is here, uh, built, I think, in 1719. Uh, there's a mill uh, where the shopping centre is now, but which was cavernous for a very long time. Um, there's an inn called the Kildare Arms Inn. Um, there are various other uh, little features. And uh, in his map reference, it seems as if Maynooth had at least 40 houses and 80 cabins, smaller uh, uh, development, smaller residential dwellings. So... That's what it looks like. Uh, and uh, he also made some pen and ink sketches. So uh, uh, he, he, he decorates his title panels with pen and ink sketches, you see. So uh, we, get, we get some sort of image. And it, it's a bit easier to see it when you do it a bit closer up. There in the background, in the mist, as it were, is, is the ruins of the castle. And um, there's some sort of bridge here. Uh, I think it's a, a little footbridge just, or something like that. And uh, there are various ruins, and uh, I, I, I have no idea what, how to match those up to anything else. So uh, I'm just showing you that, that this is the, what he saw in Maynooth when he came in the 1750s. But Maynooth, the, the map also reveals another feature, and that is at the east end of the village. And that is, uh, along with all this irregularity, there is a regular row of seven dwelling houses. And all of these can be shown from surviving leasing records to have been laid out during the uh, mid-1750s. So they're very recent. So we have this, this nice, planned, straight, uh, uh, the start of the main street. 
And these houses still exist. They are the forerunners of a new Maynooth, a place that developed quite slowly, but uh, by 1757, seven houses were in place. So um, if we want to uh, interpret um, uh, Roque's map a little bit more, uh, we can see that the, 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 those, those seven, uh, seven houses, um, we can see various dwelling houses which are mainly along the main street and which are coloured here in black and then in grey, uh, the buildings that were m identified as cabins um, of various, uh, by, by, uh, by uh, Roke, and you can see this is Parson Street. Uh, this is the rectory, uh, the old, now the old rectory, I suppose, um, which uh, I think had only been built about 1748 or thereabouts. So what it shows is that there were new features at the east end of the village, and another outline plan shows another interesting aspect of uh, the 1750s, that there seemed to have been a master plan which was never fully implemented for the remodelling of Maynooth. And this plan shows a new street plan superimposed. This is, this is the faint outline here of the Roke's map, Roke's images and so on. But here we have, uh, in slightly darker imagery lines, the, uh, the outline of a new plan. And uh, what's interesting about that is it shows a wide main street, but it's going to open up into a, a big plaza of some sort. And I think this dotted thing is, is going to be the market house. So <coughs> it's, it, 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 this is what it looks like in the original. And this is the, the, the already built houses are in red, and the plan is in yellow. Uh, and there's the market house again. Uh, so the, the, he, it's a very ambitious master plan of how the thing is going to be laid out. Um, what's interesting, I suppose, is the castle end of the town is not on this, <coughs> on this plan. Uh, it's only the east end. Uh, so uh, there's various features uh, that I've already mentioned. Uh, the charter school is uh, uh, possibly one of the first features, um, but uh, this is the area that was done by 1757. This is the way it was planned at that stage. Now, what happened next is that uh, the plan was, uh, went quite slowly, uh, probably because it was quite difficult to attract people to Maynooth. It may be hard to believe <coughs> present in the present day, but it, it was certainly quite hard to attract people in the 1750s. Um, so even though the Earl of Kildare was keen to go ahead, um, he didn't always find takers for his building plots. And uh, uh, the other element is that uh, in the absence of any buyout fund, the existing leaseholding structure had to be respected. So the western end of the, ta the town was not yet out of lease. Uh, so uh, what, what, what happened was um, most of the uh, village area had been leased out to various tenants um, and the effect was that uh, the landlord could only do a certain amount uh, easily uh, and he could do it much easier in the east than in the west. So the strategy was to issue leases to anyone who would build once houses were built, he gave out leases for a very long period, sometimes 999-year leases. So that's uh, certainly a long period. And the effect of that is that the control of the town was passed from the Earl of Kildare to the various leaseholders at some stage. The, 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 you had a situation where the Earl laid out the framework and then uh, once someone said, I'll build there, 
they got control of that site and what they could do on that site and how they could operate. They did have to, I think, uh, con conform to certain building, uh, building height requirements and they had to do these things like give the Earl uh, a chicken at Christmas and things like that, you know, uh, to, 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 as part of the deal. But otherwise, um, it was, it was uh, um, a ch change of control. Now, the, in 1773, the first Duke, the Earl of Kildare, just on previously the Earl of Kildare, died, and a progress map was made. And what you see on the progress map, which I'm afraid didn't come out very well, is that a um, certain amount of progress had been made, but uh, we've now got the market house on the south side of the main street. We've got a new chapel that has, uh, it's, it's moved from there to there, and we have slate-roofed labourers' cottages built. And these are uh, cottages and uh, low-lying buildings that uh, are still there today. Uh, and uh, the new chapel uh, it has uh, subsequently had a, a, a history uh, as a school and later as a band hall and so forth. So um, we, we can see elements of, uh, that are still there in the 1773 map. And a further progress map was made by Thomas Sherard in 1781. And his map includes various other buildings, including one called the Factory and uh, a new inn. The Factory was, um, <coughs> now, um, where the pub is today, I, I, I can't remember what the name of it. It's not the Leinster Arms. It's, it's the one on the. It's the one on the uh, the east side of the square. Brady's. Brady's. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. And then there's a new inn on the uh, west side of the square. And then he has a, an area which is identified as not yet out of lease. So he's moved westward. And these these red bits are the buildings that had gone up by then. Quite a lot of progress at the east end. Uh, and the factory was not some big smoking building with chimneys and so forth, but um, very genteel factories. Uh, uh, a news item of the late mid 1780s says that it was that the factories were making tapes, threads, and garters and stockings. So it was uh, the Duchess of Leinster getting uh, the uh, lady folk of the town to engage in improving activities like making stockings and so forth, rather than um, anything to do with uh, big, large-scale industry. I'm going to talk for a minute about the inn. Um, from the late 1770s, the inn uh, existed, and uh, it had stabling for a hundred horses. And uh, according to one uh, early uh, ad, is it offers good four-post beds and bedding, constantly well aired, and also the best meats and wines. Uh, an advertisement for the, seven, for the 1770s shows how the inn worked as a staging post between Dublin and Enfield or kin 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 Kinnegad. It was where you changed horses. Uh, so you were going out from Dublin in a clip-clop, clip-clop and all this sort of stuff. And uh, then you, you, you reached the inn, you had your meal and the ch horses were changed. You got fresh horses and you could then go on to the new inn, which is midway between uh, Maynooth and Kinnegad and which is uh, Enfield today. Uh, and uh, it gives you the rates for the horses, uh, a post chase and pair at threepence a mile and so forth, four horses at 19 pence, half penny. And then the inn was also a place for social events. It had a ballroom. So uh, the Earl, uh, the Duke celebrated his birthday. Uh, that truly patriotic and amicable nobleman, His Grace the Duke of Leinster, uh, and they dined, had bonfires and illuminations, and spent the evening in the greatest harmony and festivity. Uh, this is in 1779. And uh, uh, 10 years later, 
uh, they talk about uh, the Friendly Brothers Ball um, at Maynooth. Um, and uh, I suppose the interesting thing there is it started at, at 11 o'clock uh, at night and they danced to <coughs> one when they retired to the supper rooms, which were laid out in a very admirable style of plenty, decoration and elegance, our excellence. And then they disappeared about 3 a.m., having expressed the highest satisfaction at the entertainment of the night. And uh, if you want to, you can get the uh, full details of the meal and the drinks and so forth. And uh, from time to time, the, the inn was used for, for instance, for the Kilcock races. It was used because uh, the rooms in Kilcock were small, uh, whereas you could have a large crowd at the inn in Maynooth. And uh, several hundred people assembled in 1812 for the 21st birthday of the uh, then third Duke of uh, Leinster. <coughs> so it's been a feature for... Uh, almost 250 years. Um, it's a big complex. And uh, in the 1880s, it had become the uh, Leinster Arms Hotel. And I, I just put this on because I thought it was quite interesting to see that uh, it's, it's used at that stage for, uh, for the in the picnic season and for wedding and other parties. The drive from Dublin through the Phoenix Park strawberry beds Salmon Leap, Carton and the College um, being one of the most uh, enjoyable summer excursions in Ireland. Tell that to the commuters uh, <laughs> doing uh, rush hour uh, at, uh, at the present time. Uh, but that's what it was like in the 1880s, folks. And by then it also had WCs and still had a spacious ballroom. So we look at developments uh, a bit later, and some of the ones around the turn of the 18th century, at the end of the 18th century, include the development of the college, the Royal Canal, and uh, the new bridge that allows the Turnpike Road to bypass uh, the, uh, the castle. Uh, the first bypass was uh, the new bridge. Um, uh, and uh, I suppose... Uh, the castle really had very, the canal had very little impact, but the college had a big impact. I think that's what I'm trying to say on this slide. Uh, but it, these developments also uh, have the impact of making, uh, shaping the way further development <coughs> takes place in Maynooth because they limit how far west the main street can go. It's limited by the college particularly, and by perhaps the new bridge. So a survey of 1821 can be seen as an indication of the completed new town of Maynooth. It's really more or less completed by then. And you can see we've got the main street in place by then. That's it there. We've got our inn. We've got our market house. We've got the castle ruins. And we've got the bridge uh, allowing us to bypass the <coughs> old road uh, through the castle. And we've also got the, ca the college, quite a lot of the college, in place by then. So, uh, at least as far as street form is concerned, the east changes, but the west remains very much as it was for a very long time, the castle the winding Parson Street, and then the college based on uh, Stoit House that had been there for uh, uh, some time previously too. Um, by the 1820s, Maynooth had a, a range of shops and trades as a commercial directory uh, shows, and uh, I don't want to spend time on this, but you can see quite a lot of grocers and um, publicans and uh, various other characters, saddlers and butchers, uh, appearing on the list of trades in Maynooth at that particular time. Now, if we look at developments after 1820, um, most of them related to particular buildings 
or to infill behind the main street. A courthouse was added, and in terms of infill, a lot of smaller houses and other small dwellings, like cottages and cabins, were added to sites with lane frontages. So you get lanes, the lanes beginning to develop. Um, so we have, if we look at what happened in the 1820s and 1830s, the courthouse comes in on the, what was by then the, the main square, which previously had been where the market house was. Um, there's a post office that has emerged. Uh, it pos probably was there much earlier, actually. Um, there's the new uh, Catholic church. Um, the charter school has become the presentation convent. Um, various developments like that. And then we can see houses along Pound Street um, and some of the lanes are beginning to fill up a little bit as well. The courthouse had a 100 year history, um, built uh, w first of all alongside the market house, then courthouse plus town, town hall, and then uh, bang in 1920 uh, as part of the turbulence associated with the War of Independence. So that's the end of the courthouse. And ever since, I think, there's been a little bit of an uncertainty of what to do with the main square in Maynooth. Um, some of you will remember what I, certainly I used to hear of as the thing. Um, <laughs> I think that the, the thing was, uh, was, was, was one of the less successful initiatives that was uh, in the 1970s. Um, and the thing, I think, disappeared of sometime in the 1990s um, by popular, uh, po popular demand and uh, agreement, I think. Isn't that correct, I think? But what we see is uh, this business about the, 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 the leaving aside the courthouse, uh, the, the intensification, new, new sm areas of small housing, all behind the main street, and then somewhere like Kelly's Lane, uh, uh, which is quite near the centre of Maynooth, um, uh, and little cottages beginning to develop along there uh, in the 1820s, 1830s and longer. Uh, the Historic Towns Atlas shows Maynooth in 1838. Um, a nice clean looking map, I suppose, uh, has edited out quite a lot of the warts and uh, uh, leaves us with uh, a quite a nice impression of Maynooth at that time. The Ordnance Survey does the same. Um, and yet we have this theme that I want to come back to, that maps do reveal, but they also conceal. So, I, I, I just think when we look at that, that, that map of the Ordnance Survey or the Historic Towns Atlas, it shows a nice clean Maynooth, but it gives us very little insight into what I've been trying to explain over the last few minutes of the, the rather slow uh, and irregular and modifying development that developments that took place uh, over the previous 50 to 60 years particularly the period between 1750 and 18, uh, 1820. So we'll, we, we move now to, to thinking a little bit just briefly about the uh, late 18, uh, later 19th century. And one of the features of the 1840s is an expanded college, a second quadrangle uh, designed uh, to a master plan by Pugin, uh, the chapel, which uh, relates to the 1870s, and the, the great spire, uh, which was built at the end of the 19th century. Uh, this is Pugin's master plan. This is the major development of the mid-19th century. Um, and uh, uh, it's shown up in various postcards of the later part of the century, um, uh, which in, it must be actually the early 20th century because the spire is, in sh is shown in, the, uh, in this particular postcard. Um, and the interior of the chapel, the great interior of the chapel, is shown on another postcard. We get an impression of the investment and the scale of the development of the second half of the 19th century. Um, there was great development, particularly in the late 1840s. 
most people would think of the late 1840s as the famine period in Ireland. In Maynooth, it was a rather different experience. Uh, there was a cholera outbreak in 1848. 47 people died then. It was the second cholera outbreak. Uh, there'd been one in 1832 when about 30 people died. Nobody died in Kilcock, <laughs> but people died in Maynooth, and they wondered why. And uh, at the time, they thought it was a bad air and that it was, Maynooth was low-lying. So you, 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 uh, the miasma theory, if, if you like. Um, whereas, in fact, it turned out to be a waterborne problem. And, uh, they, but they only twigged that much later. And uh, in the, in, in the mid-1840s, late 1840s, cholera was the, 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 the scourge in Maynooth rather than the famine. And uh, one of the things is that uh, in Maynooth at that time, uh, there was a huge amount of employment uh, and activity. The railway works and the college were, were in bringing in large numbers of tradesmen and labourers. And one of the further consequences was a, a price gouging exercise, I think, by several of the middle landlords. These are the people who now ran the main street um, and who were developing the lanes behind the main street. And they had uh, took advantage of the idea that there were so many people looking for accommodation. There was a housing crisis in Maynooth in the 1840s and that raised the rents of houses far beyond a fair rateable value. You could, you, could, you could hear the same comments today. Uh, it's exactly the same process that we're talking about, I think, um, uh, of uh, demand for housing. Uh, and that was uh, eclipsing the issue of the famine as far as Maynooth was concerned. Some other features um, of the late 18th and 19th century include refurbishing the Protestant church, building a Protestant school, a very small one, um, 11 pupils, I think, um, the station and the railway, uh, a doctor, uh, a dispensary, uh, and a football field by 1903. Tidying up the castle area was an initiative of 1848 uh, in, in anticipation that Queen Victoria might uh, be coming and uh, uh, you'd better have it a bit better than it, it was. So um, the Duke uh, did a, a pretty rapid job of railing the place in and tidying the place up uh, in order that uh, Her Majesty uh, was suitably uh, impressed with the Duke's uh, town. Uh, this is the small little Protestant school. Uh, some of you will know it on the way to the railway station, uh, for instance. Um, this is the Protestant church um, that has a medieval origin uh, in it. And then the uh, railway opened in 1847, uh, making Maynooth now under an hour from Dublin. So uh, that was, uh, that was a, a new development. I think, in fact, you could get to Dublin in 37 minutes uh, by 1870, except there were only two trains a day, I think, but uh, you could still do it if you, if you got, the, got your timing right. Now, I'm finally, finally finishing, uh, nearly finishing, um, we're looking at the period around 1900, and we're talking about what did Maynooth look like about 1900. It had a population then of about 1,000 excluding the college population, right? Excluding the college population, around a 1,000. <coughs> and the Ordnance Survey large-scale map, which was revised in 1909, gives us some impression of the town at the start of the 20th century. Um, we can see the, a lot of detail on this, uh, this town, uh, this town plan. Um, Port House Square, the Market House, uh, it, it, it was in fact, I think, the Town Hall by then. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the layout of the, uh, all sorts of details about pumps and uh, water sources and schools and whatnot, 
uh, are included on this particular uh, large scale plan. So we get an impression, and we get an impression of the main street area from, uh, from uh, postcards particularly. Um, this is a, a view of the main street from the east, uh, looking down towards uh, the college. Uh, some two well-known postcards. Um, and, uh, you know, until about 30 years ago, uh, those houses on the, uh, on the uh, uh, north side of the street, they weren't that much different to what they are in that image there. Uh, Buckley's uh, house had changed, or Buckley's building had changed. I think it was burnt by the Black and Tans in 1920, but uh, Buckley's had changed. But quite a lot of them were looking very similar to what they did uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, 1900. And then uh, MP O'Brien, uh, I think this is actually slightly later than 1900. I think MP O'Brien turned up in Maynooth um, uh, about uh, 1910 or sometime like that. They were spirit, grocers and spirit dealers. Cassidy's Roost, I can't remember what they're called now, but it was, it's where Cassidy's Roost was for a long time in any case. And this, this, so this is looking from, from, the, from the, the west and uh, another view from the west. Um, mm, uh, a bit quieter than today, uh, I think. Um, looks as if you could stand in the middle of the main street and not be knocked down <laughs> immediately, you know. Uh, so that, uh, it looks, looks quite good. And here's another group of people standing in the middle of the main street. Um, and uh, I, I think that I put this one in because I thought it, it was good because it gives you the impression of a, a town where animals and carts were still the, still the main feature of, of the place. Um, and one or two men uh, doing the proverbial uh, leaning on their shovels um, and uh, uh, trying to, uh, uh, posing for the camera of course, stopping work just to pose for the camera. Um, uh, so we've got these various ones, and uh, uh, another image that I like particularly is of the Kildare Hunt in, uh, in, in 1903, making a leisurely progress down the main street, uh, not worried by the traffic or stopping the traffic or anything like that, um, on their way to do their weekly, uh, their weekly uh, depredation of the countryside, um, or whatever you like to call it. Um, the poor old foxes uh, had a pretty uh, tough time in Kildare, I think, at times, because the Kildare hunt uh, certainly had a weekly, they might have had a, even two or three meetings a week, I think, at one stage. Um, but the, uh, the, I like the one of just the, them coming down the main street. So this was the Maynooth that was seen by royal visitors in 1903. Uh, Edward VII came, and in 1911, uh, George V came. And here you can see him uh, with Cardinal Logue um, uh, and uh, Queen Mary, I suppose, uh, uh, after their inspection of the Royal College of uh, St. Patrick. Um, so... Uh, uh, the, the, this, this is, this is the, 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 the brighter side of Maynooth, but there are other more sobering aspects of Maynooth uh, in the recorded in the 1901 census. And I want to just uh, nearly conclude uh, by thinking about what their majesties might have seen or what they might have smelt more particularly uh, had they turned left before uh, entering the college. Uh, in uh, 1903 or indeed in 1911. The 1901 census has oodles of information when you go to the uh, household returns and uh, it tells you about the outbuildings in Maynooth. 439 outbuildings uh, alongside the houses of Maynooth and these included 60 stables. It, it's a, it's a it's a town of animals at that stage, as well as people. 60 stables, 90 piggeries, piggeries, yeah. Uh, 80 fowl houses and 30 cow houses. How many are there today? Not too many, I think. Anyway, uh, this 
uh, produces a situation which is quite interesting, I think, of the condition of Maynooth. And uh, the local newspapers uh, uh, were in full swing by 1900. Uh, there was the Leinster Leader, which was uh, largely nationalist, and the Kildare Observer, which was a little bit more, I suppose, establishment. Both of them, though, talked about the condition of Maynooth. And the, the Selbridge number one rural district council um, was uh, the uh, local authority uh, from 1898, and they had a council engineer who spoke on the unsanitary condition of the town of Maynooth. And I think he says unsanitary rather than insanitary or anything else. But anyway, uh, the condition uh, of things there is disgraceful, he said. And he has a very long report recorded in the Kildare Observer, if you ever want to read it. He talks about whole streets are devoid of the commonest form of sanitary accommodation. And as a consequence, filth has been accumulating for years. Conditions were especially poor uh, along uh, parts of Parson Street where there were about 25 houses of the poorest class. And I just need to say, this bears no resemblance to Parson Street today. I am not trying to in any way make any comments or insinuate in any way about Parson Street at the present time. So, uh, but there, you, what you will notice uh, from the image here is there is a stream. Uh, sometimes on one of the maps, early maps of Maynooth, it's called the Jones Lane, Slade River, uh, it runs into the Lyrene, um, but it runs along one side, the college wall is there, and uh, the stream is here, and this is uh, the houses of Parson Street uh, as they are today, and a lot of them have been improved no end. But uh, in 1901, uh, he talks about several pretty rough masonry drains received the surface water. In some cases, the gratings have been removed, and into these drains, night soil, slops, and everything is thrown. They're the only source of convenience I could find to accommodate the calls of nature. Where they're on the soil from the water closets from the college enters, after the wash from a slaughterhouse and piggeries. This exists for the past 30 years. And I'm not trying to in wallow in all this, but I, I do think it's quite interesting and important to try to set this alongside the idea of the college and the Royal, the Main Street and the Royal visitors to Maynooth, that there was another side to Maynooth that deserves to be uh, under, understood. Other sources of pollution included the waste tar from the college works from the college gas works and that was seeping through the wall into the stream and adding to the pollution and of course by then they'd found out that that stream was also the source of the cholera outbreaks in the 19 in the 19, 1840s uh, so it's, it was a really big problem uh, so I, I just come back to this theme of this presentation the map reveals but it also conceals and the, the map of 1909 leaves a lot, it shows us this nice planned town, but it leaves a lot out about living conditions, especially living conditions away from the main street. And the history of the 20th, first half of the 20th century is really very much about improving Maynooth. And I'm going to leave you with uh, this image of Maynooth in 1965. It was still uh, then a small town, but compared to what it was in 1901, it was vastly changed. And of course, in the next 60 years, it would vastly change again. So that's my story. Thanks very much. <laughs>